The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to bring someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show by popular demand. The last interview we had was completely awesome. Everybody loved it and said, get this guy back on. He gave us some incredible investment ideas, and he's here again today to talk a little bit about macro, but to dive into a couple ideas that I think you're going to like even better than the ideas that he presented the other day. So Chris McIntosh, welcome back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. It's good to be here, George. Thanks very much for having me on. All right, buddy. Let's just dive right into the questions. Right now, we've got this really interesting situation with the S&P 500, where it goes down faster than it's ever gone down in history. And correct me if I'm wrong on that. And it goes down by like 33%. Then we have this huge rebound, I think 4,000 points it gains. And then it's kind of just gone back and forth. Now it seems like we're in this holding pattern where is you're kind of asking yourself, okay, is all of the downside to what's going on with the, the we'll call it the illness for YouTube, uh, is all the downside already priced into the market? And uh, I hear a lot of bulls saying that. From my standpoint, I'd say, well, maybe that's true, but the, the 700 in QE, the QE infinity, the repo, all the other money printing that's going on, the Fed stimulus, two trillion, or excuse me, the federal government stimulus, two trillion, all that's baked into the market as well. So are we at a, a fair value right now, or do you see this kind of being the eye of the storm? I actually just think that's the wrong way to look at it because your risk of getting whipsawed is, is high. And what I mean by that is if you kind of just step back and say, okay, like we can take, here's the problem. Markets are forward looking. So you're looking at any particular, like it's just a collect, when you say the markets, it's a collective of all those companies. And we pulled out one of those companies, like Apple as an example. Yeah, right. And you say, okay, you know, what's Apple valued at today? And, and that's when you're trying to value it today, you're actually valuing it based on what it's going to look like tomorrow. That's all that we're doing. Like mm -hmm. today's value is actually just a representation of what we think it's going to be like tomorrow or a year's time and so on and so forth. So when you look out and you go, okay, fine, what are its earnings going to be? What are it, are it, are it, have the expenses gone down and all those, all the normal types of things that we, you would value any business on. So forget mm -hmm. about Fibonacci levels, <clears throat> excuse me, forget about any of that sort of stuff. What you're just looking at is saying, is this business viable and is it cheap or is it expensive? The difficulty is that the market participants in the market don't quite understand or they don't know what their future looks like. Um, and on a normal basis, if you didn't have any interference, then you've got less metrics to work with, which makes it easier. You simply look out and you go, okay, we, you know, you can, you have to make some base assumptions. You say, okay, well, we think possibly GDP is going to contract by, and you come up with some figure, which is based around unemployment numbers. It's based around how many industries have closed, how many you think will actually open, um, and how many will actually go away, and so on and so forth. And you, you work through all these various matrix of, of different guesswork, really, which is all that analysts do. And you come out with some figure and you go, okay, I think that's what the economy is going to look like in six months time in 12 months time as a consequence what should apple's earnings look like and you can come to a figure and then you can work it back and go oh, is it cheap or is it expensive now the the issue that we have today that makes us more complex is that that's based on a a market without any um interference but like we've fed got like market, you're talking about fed intervention but we're talking about massive interference in both from the Fed as well as from governments in terms of um, – so the Fed's going to – they're doing QE and they're doing um, a whole host of different things. But on top of that, you've also got um, government stepping in with bailout packages for individuals, for corporates, um, all these other things. And, and that is such a fast-moving target. I mean, it's almost every day we wake up and there's some new something – and, and a lot of it's not even getting 
you know, mentioned because it's not top line news. It's top line news if it's a $2 trillion package. But there's a whole lot of other pork that gets thrown into different sectors and and it's it's very difficult to keep track of it all. And so that changes all of those dynamics around what is, I'm just using Apple as an example, what's Apple's future earnings, what should they look like? Um, for me, if, look, I don't know, the bulls might be right, the bears might be right, and I've got friends on both both sides of that aisle, mm. and I'm preferring not to play that game per se. What I prefer to do is really just step back from all the chaos. We know that there's demand destruction. We know that there's supply destruction. This is the first time that we've actually really ever had both at the same time. Yeah. And then we've got this phenomenal stimulus, call it what you will, just call it intervention. Um, that historically was always, well, certainly post GFC, in fact, even prior to that, it was QE and it was um, it was a manipulation of the of the yield curve, which was, so it was a credit stimulus, right? And I think we've reached the end of that particular game because the um, in fact we've seen that the, you know the Fed cut rates didn't the market just kept falling, and right. so um, the the credit stimulus side of things has pretty much run its course. I also don't think that. Um, the Fed are going to go down the, the negative interest rate path. Japan and, and Europe tried it, and it didn't work. Um, and there seems to be a consensus amongst all of the point issues that that's not going to work. And I agree. Um, but then that leaves you with other, with few other alternatives, which is where I keep coming down on the side that we don't really have any other options available to us other than a fiscal and B MMT and MMT had been, when when I say MMT just for people it's modern monetary theory which and you know for those who follow it um, don't don't yell at me I'll just try and simplify it but it's basically a monetization <laughs> of debt that's really what in the, in its simplest terms that's what it comes down to um, and. And so, when you look at that as a as a as the options available, um, then I look back at now and I go, "What's the S and P at now? What's it going to be?" And and really, I think it's the wrong question to ask. In that, if we look at what's likely to take place, it's, look, investment is just a matter of probabilities. What's likely to take place, in my humble opinion, is simply that they're going to have to monetize debt. We've got 256 trillion global debt, something like that. God knows what it is today, it's probably more. Um, that's, and in terms of debt to GDP, we've well exceeded pretty much anything that we had, we had in the past. Um, if we go back and look at Rogoff and Reinhardt's work on that, they came up with a figure of roughly 80, 90% debt to GDP, if you exceeded that. You, no country really had the ability to actually pay back those debts, and we well exceeded that anyway. So you look say, well, how do you how do you get yourself out of that debt trap? And there's two ways. One was the um, deflation, which was what we had in the um, Great Depression, um, and we know that central banks have have um, spent a lot of time understanding that dynamic. I mean, that was that was the the crux of Bernanke's work was the study of the Great Depression and ensuring that we never went through that again. Um, but it's not just Bernanke. So there's a there's a wide uh, swathe of academics who sit in these positions that have studied that and under and feel like they understand it. Um, so I think the probability of us going down that path is much less than it would otherwise be. It's like the general always fights the last war, right? If you always got attacked through that door, you kind of know that you've got to barricade that door. And that's what you focus on. Because you're like, I'm not letting that happen again. Um, so I don't think the probability of a, of a, a 1929 style deflationary outcome is very high. That combined with the fact that we've had this, this increasing attention to MMT 
Um, and many people suggesting that that's um, both reasonable and will produce the results that they anticipate, um, I think leads us down that path. So that and that path is quite different. Um, so and and it, to be clear, it would be inflationary. I can't see any other outcome or to be more specific stagflationary as in you can have an inflationary outcome previously our inflationary outcomes were as a consequence of global growth and that's another problem people say we well, can't have inflation because growth's falling well that's just rubbish um, you can easily have an inflation in in any particular asset price whether you have a deflationary broad deflationary environment or a broad inflationary environment we just think about something like um Asian swine flu or Asian bird flu. In those instances, so like with, with Asian um, bird flu, nobody wanted any any chickens, right? right? So they slaughtered a ton of chickens. So your demand collapsed because no one wanted to eat a chicken because they thought they were going to die. And so all the farmers were like, well, nobody wants our chickens. <clears throat> so, so they slaughtered them all and they replaced them mostly with pigs. So broadly, you could have had either an inflationary environment or a deflationary environment. But in those two sectors, you had um, deflation in, in chicken prices. Because right. even though your supply was collapsing, your demand was collapsing more. Mm -hmm. right? But in pigs, you had massive inflation because the supply was not sufficient to take up for all of the, the, the demand for pigs as a result because it did move from chickens to pigs basically i'm trying to simplify it, but basically you can have inflation in certain asset classes or deflation in asset classes depending on on a number of other things um and so when you think about mmt and you think about um the consequences of that that's and it's also a, a direct injection if you will of stimulus to the patient and the patient being the individual the consumer um not like we had qe qe was basically just shoveling capital into the banking system and a lot of that they just parked in reserves so it never found its way into the bank into the the real economy and the other thing that took place was that for a bank the, their objectivity is to make money and it's much, much easier to make money on leverage. So guess what? Well, the, the capital that did get funneled in may, found its way into stocks and bonds and real estate. Mm -hmm. Because of course you can leverage that. Like what, you know, so, <clears throat> so you had the funnel, basically the hose got turned to that sector. Now they're looking at taking saying, oh, well, if we push it into the banks like we did last time and the banks are fearful as they will be because you've got a collapse in all those collateral that they've typically been using, stocks, bonds, real estate. They're fearful, so they hold back. And if you can park the money in, in, um, in reserves and earn a small yield, you just do that. And so it's not going to find its way into the economy. Um, so they're saying, well, move the hose and you know channel it down this path over here. Um, and I believe that'll have a very different outcome. Um, in particular sectors, it's not going to necessarily send your real estate back up or your financial assets back up. Um, so, back to your question, I, I, I just, to a certain extent, I'm not interested in that question. I'm interested in what are the consequences of this chaos? Where are we going with it? And positioning according to that on a longer term time frame if that's the focus how do you make a decision on when to pull the trigger like in like last uh, video that was just wildly popular and this is kind of backed by by popular demand getting you back so soon but uh everyone we were or you were talking about tankers or you're talking about coal or, or 3d printing so how do you know okay like today as an example we're in this holding pattern. We don't know if the bulls are right. We don't know if the bears are right. So do you pull the trigger on one of those now or do you wait a week or do you scale in? What, how, how do the pros do it or how do you do it with your fund? I think the way to think about it is you buy things when they're cheap and you sell them. <laughs> it's, look, it's, it's... You're telling me what I tell everybody. Literally don't... Here's the problem. 
no one's going to know. I mean, like, unless you're a technical trader, and I've got some friends that are, are, are very good at that. Um, and look, that's, that's a different game altogether. 90% of people can't play it. And I mean, can't play it because psychologically, it's, it's very tough. Right. I, I traded FX for just under two years full time. And it was one of my most profitable periods of life, but it was the mo I was a shitty person to be around. Yeah. It was not good. It was not good for me. It wasn't good for my family. It wasn't good for anyone. And the reason behind that is because it's incredibly stressful. Yeah. Um, your, your average person shouldn't put themselves in a position like that. And I don't put myself in that position anymore either. Um, I just don't. So, so when to pull the trigger? <clears throat> Look, if something, think about a business like, so if you're going to buy a business that's not a listed equity, let's say you and I decide, fine, we're going to go and buy. Um, I used the example of a gas station the other day. Yeah, a gas, a gas station. station. It, like we, we're going to sit down. We're going to look at um, what the balance sheet looks like. We're going to look at the income statement. We're going to value this thing and we're going to say, would we own that company? Is it going to pay us every year to own this thing and to can we staff the place? What are our op what's the OPEX going to be? What's the you know work that we might need? We'll factor it all in and we come up. We go, yeah, this is a great business. You know, this it's it's on the main highway. There's always going to be traffic. Cool, this is a good business. And we don't worry about what the market out there might price it at tomorrow or the next day or the next day. We just say, is it going to pay us? Uh, you know, in terms of of return on our capital, um, yes or no. What is the price we'd be prepared to pay? Maybe it's a little bit expensive. And we go back to the owner and we go, look, you know, we want 10% off or whatever the case might be. And then if that's the case, and that's the way you view a market or an equity, or you can either just put in a, a stink bid at that price where you feel that that's real good value, or you could sell a, um, a call option on it um, and, and have it put to you. Um, at a price that you that you um, uh, you would you would want. So, I mean, <clears throat> I just you're going to get whipsawed otherwise, George, um, yeah. because you're never going to necessarily know where that bottom is. And then what happens is you you get you know the markets now it looks like it could you know this could be the bottom, um, and you buy it and it goes up and you think you're a genius and then it collapses. And, and right. guess what? This, that was just a, it was a dead cat bounce. What do you do now? So, and, and I'll tell you what people do. They all panic and they sell because they're not just stopping and, and looking at it like a gas station going, hey, did I want to own this thing or didn't I want to own it? And so the broad market, you know, is, is trying to trade that broad market um, unless you're a pro. And even then, I mean, it's it's just I think it's the wrong way to look at it. So I ra yeah. I'd rather look at what's that long term thing. My long term view is we're going to have a stagflationary environment because there is no other way out for this incredible debt burden. Mm -hmm. um, and there's going to be some assets which I think, you know, on a nominal basis, like people ask me, oh, you know, is real estate going to do well? Is it? Look, we've got a vast majority of the populace in the Western world that are indebted. So politically, it's pretty tough to turn around and, and shaft them and tell them, sorry, mate. So it's easier to simply deflate away that that um, that Infl debt. You mean inflate it? Sorry, away? Inflate, inflate away that okay. debt. Okay. Um, and and that would be politically more feasible. Um, so and what you're doing is you're sacrificing the creditors for the debtors. Right. And, and I think that that makes so much sense um, on on multiple levels. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter whether I think it's a good thing to do. It's just like it doesn't matter that none of that matters. It's only really what is likely to happen. The pushback to that would probably be, OK, Chris, well, they tried to create inflation for the last 12 years, but they weren't able to do it. They're always struggling to be at their call it 2% target. But I think the way you would answer that is just 
earlier in our conversation, you'd say, well, they're just pointing the hose in the wrong direction. And now they understand that two they things. need to they the pointed, hose. Toward the, they pointed the hose, but the other thing was they were using credit as the instrument mm. to, to, to manipulate asset prices. And, and that's going to change. If they monetize debt, then it's a, it's a different ball game. Right. It's a different ball game. So um, by monetizing the debt, you actually deflate the debt, right? As as a as a as a whole proportion of of that debt load, um, you start deflating that debt, um, and when people then and then there's a feedback because people start figuring out, oh, it's it's just it's quite simple. Like let's say your property that you live in is worth I don't know, a million bucks, <clears throat> and it doesn't go up in value, but it doesn't go down, right? Um, and and but then you go to the store every day, and suddenly it's ten percent more and. 15% more and 20% more. Um, and you have your wages haven't gone up either necessarily. Um, and that's your stagflationary period. The last time we really had that at scale was in the 1800s. And so people tend to not think about what that could look like because they haven't studied it and they haven't looked at what could take place. Um, but what we're seeing right now has never taken place before. So you can throw out the rule book and all of this stuff. So you um, see it differently than the 1970s? In the 70s, it was just inflationary. It wasn't stagflationary per se. Back in the 1800s, you had a truly stagflationary type of environment. So, so how would you define stagflation? Because the typical uh, uh, definition I hear is just high inflation, high unemployment. So your misery index is extremely high. Do you have a different way of, of seeing it? Yeah, it's it's a well. No, that's pretty much it. It's a stagnant economy. So your 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 economy isn't growing. Where if if people wanted to get an idea of what it looks like, it tends to be statist economies. Because mm. what happens in a statist economy is that the government crowds out the private sector, and and when it does so, it does it typically in whatever that sector is, it's inefficient. Or right. certainly inefficient comparative to alternatives, <clears throat> and so um, in those environments you will have a um, you know stuff gets produced, but it gets pr produced very inefficiently, mm -hmm. um, and there tends to be a lack of supply. Um, I mean, I guess the most egregious type of example would be Venezuela, um, and and no two ones are the same. There's always you know, many nuances to any particular country or any particular economic system. But by and large, you have a crowding out of the private sector in, um, in one or many industries, um, which makes them inefficient and it causes the cost of whatever it is that they're producing to be higher than it would otherwise be. Right. Um, and so that's a stagnant, shitty economy. Um, yeah. where Even you, inflation is going up in real terms. There's not much GDP growth, if, if not uh, negative, yeah. uh, real GDP growth, when nominal GDP growth could be at 3 4 5%. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you look back at the GFs, post-GFC, there was the nationalization of um, essentially the auto industry, the insurance industry, um, banking industry. And to their credit, they stepped out of that. They managed to actually step out of that. And that was always a threat. That was always a risk that you would have really moved away from capitalism um, to, to some statism or, or um, I don't know what you want to call it. but And they did manage to actually step out of that um, and, and kind of hand it back to the private sector. Um, this time, that's going to be more difficult. Um, we're seeing hand out, you know, people putting their hand out in every single industry. And... And they're going to because this is a this is a major economic destruction impact. Um, <clears throat> so it doesn't matter if you're in the tourism industry, airline industry, um, hospitality, restaurants, you name it. This is just this is really really widespread, which is why um, again why I think they're going to go down that MMT path. It's very difficult to if you have one particular industry and you can see it's in trouble you can bail it out and you can try and manufacture something around that and, and have 
the rest of the economy essentially support that industry. So if it was just airlines that had that shut, and that's big enough of, on its own, you can kind of support that. But it's not just that. It's also tourism. And it's, it, it's, you just, it's also so many other sectors. So right. how do you, do you then like create departments to deal with each one and, and how much it's just, no, they're just gonna, so they're gonna, they'll do some bailouts, I think, in terms of major industries, but by and large, I think they're gonna say, bypass all those corporates and inject it directly into the patient and let the patient try and, and spend its way up. So, so you have a trickle up effect rather than a trickle down effect. Right. And that is a very different um, way of going about doing it. It also means that the the capital, the way that that capital gets spent um, is going to be quite different to the way a corporate would spend the money or, or a corporate would um, allocate that capital. Right. <clears throat> so, and that's yeah, more or... like a psychological issue. If you've lost your job and you now got some, some cash to spend um, and you get an injection, you're going to, when you're going to hoard it, you're going to um, initially you're going to just pay for your your necessities, <clears throat> um, but it's not going to go into typical discretionary consumer spending. You're not going to go out to the restaurant and go, "Hey kids, we're off to the movies." That's not going right. to work. Um, so, so, so you have the the where that capital gets spent, how it gets allocated. Yeah. So the Correct. fire hose is is pointed at your just consumer staples and it's not pointed at share buybacks or or corporate debt or something like that. So that, I think that's really the takeaway is you've got to be cognizant of where the money is going, what types of goods and services will it chase. I, I want it, we're gonna get into the your some more of your investment ideas because we're, those were just wildly popular <laughs> on the last video. So we're gonna get into that in just a moment, but I, I wanna just ask you maybe one or two more questions regarding the macro so people understand the environment because that's key before you look at the investment ideas and what might be right or wrong for your portfolio. So we talked about how you think on a moving forward basis, the government is going to be a lot more involved with the economy. It's going to make it less efficient, less dynamic, therefore producing fewer goods and services, while at the same time, they're taking more money and injecting it into the system, chasing those goods and services. That's why you're seeing this stagflation prices go up. So I got that. What about the yield curve? So we've talked or we've heard of the, I think Brainerd it was, came, and a lot of people have talked about it, going back to World War II, where the Fed knows that they've got to keep interest rates down. If the 10-year goes up to 3 4 5%, that's going to do almost as much damage as the, as the illness. So, and, and I think it's confusing for people because just your average Joe thinks that the Federal Reserve controls the just the interest rates but it, the way i see it they only control and barely control the fed funds and that's they've been losing control of that you can just see it in the repo market so i guess my question is does the fed control interest rates if so do they control the entire yield curve in theory no what worries me in 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 this is that they can pretty much do anything that they want. If you look at how, how Japan has essentially just controlled the entire um, bond market in Japan, I mean, it's one of these places you just don't show up. Why would you? You know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's there's basically there's no private participation in the in the Japanese government bond yeah, there's market. There's no buyers and sellers because like, the the BOJ owns thing, right? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's it's a little bit probably like if you were going to have um a sports game with kim jong-un a game of tennis like why turn up because you know you're gonna lose right <laughs> yeah. he's gonna win yeah. <laughs> either that or you're gonna get a bullet in the head and you're like yeah i think i'll let him win so there is the ability for central banks to do that and, and i do think that allowing <clears throat> interest rates to rise too much um given that we have such an indebted both uh, sovereign at the sovereign level we have so much debt and at the um, 
corporate and even consumer, less so than a consumer level, but at the corporate level, so much debt that they'd be extremely hesitant to to let any of that um, do what it should do, which is clear. <clears throat> because a clearance at this point is, would just be freaking catastrophic. Um, it would just, you know, so I think there's, there's, and I think that's why they'll just need to inflate away that, that debt um, over time. And that's why they kind of what they yield did. curve. So, and, and if I'm seeing it right, so they try to peg the yield curve, meaning, and what that means is, let's say the three month T bill, they're not having too much problem with that, but the uh, two year, the 10 year, the 30 year, they've got to keep those rates down. And the way that the Fed would keep those rates down is they would print more money to buy the bonds. That creates more demand, it drives the price uh, up and the interest rate down. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the only way that they could try to control the long end of the curve. Is that correct? And that's why it's inflationary, yes. because that's more money in the in the economy, mm. right? Yeah, and and so I see this as only two, two, two ways out of that. <clears throat> um, one is exactly what you just talked about now, um, but that, that presupposes that there is a buyer for that debt that they issue. The treasury. If there's not, yeah, if there's not, then they have to come into the market themselves. So you kind of move into a Japanese type of situation there where they essentially control that side of the market. Um, and the other is that when you move down that path and they're, they're monetizing the debt because they have to keep the yield curve under control, so they're monetizing the debt. You then start seeing that that impact on particular asset classes in terms of inflation. And so, if you think about a bond, a sovereign bond, a government bond, all that really it is is just long dated currency. So, um, a dollar, a, a euro, a, a pound sterling, whatever it is, in terms of the currency, <clears throat> if you wouldn't own the short dated then why would you own the long? And if you wouldn't own the long, why would you own the short? There's no reason to own it. And so we quite quickly move into a breakdown in the faith of owning that particular currency, right? And the thing is that can happen really, really quickly. And so you can then have a situation where you don't have, it doesn't really matter what the yield curve looks like when nobody wants to own the paper. Um, and, and so, you can have come back to what I was talking about, which is a stagflationary environment that can kind of grind its way higher or it can just flip really quickly and you can move into um, a situation where it doesn't really matter what they're, they're doing with the bond market. No, nobody wants to own the paper. So it, it essentially just goes away. Um, the, and I don't know how this works out, but the re part of the reason why we've not had anything even of remotely like that so far is we've never had a situation in the world where the major liquidity options in currencies or bond markets are all pretty much in the same boat and that's the euro yen dollar um there's always been some sort of exit valve right so if you go back and you just think about the mexican peso crisis you had this problem there, not particularly dissimilar to that which we have in the in the developed world today, but there was an option out, and so the market went, fuck it, we're out of that, and they moved into dollars, and so you had a strong uh, move in the dollar and into dollar-based assets, um, because on a relative basis, that's where you needed to be. So the dollar was where you needed to be. It was much, much stronger. The economy was stronger, blah, 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 blah. Today, we've kind of got euro, yen, dollar, and they're all just really ugly. And so you see the capital kind of shifting around, trying to figure out which of those three ugly girls to take home at the end of the night. Um, you know, it's like you're forced to take a girl home and you, you, just, uh, you know, you've got to have another drink because they're all ugly. And you've got to pick one at the end of the night. And that's the market that we're in right now. Um, and, and that actually... It, it, it creates more systemic risk because it's allowed those participants to do things that they would never have been able to do in isolation. But their currency would in, inflate to oblivion. 
Yeah, and 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 the bond market, you know, the bond vigilantes as have always, you know, um, fixed that problem to to a certain ex- you know a certain extent. You go back to like the Asian crisis. I mean, that was it. You you had the um, you could the bond vigilantes figured out. I say bonds. I mean, it was just the market really figuring out that you had over indebted um, countries and, and originally developers. Um, but just you know, um, equity markets, and um, and the mispricing of assets, and so they called it out, and you had that that shift of capital that left from that area and went somewhere else, but it had somewhere else to go, George. Right. In this instance, large pools of capital don't have anywhere to go, and so they're kind of been stuck in this this hotel California. Um, you know, if you're a big currency trader. Um, one of the sovereign wealth funds or anything of that even doesn't even need to be that big and you need to move a portion of your portfolio. Um, you can't do it without being euro yen dollar. You know, people say to me, oh, but well, you could buy, you know, you could buy gold. I'm like, for fuck's sakes, you can't. Are you kidding me? What, you're going to move like, you look at some of these sovereign wealth funds and you've got to move even just 10% of that cash allocation. You cannot move it into into anything other than euro euro yen dollar maybe sterling kind of thing chris can you just unpack that quickly here i, I don't want to interrupt your thought but for those of you uh, the viewers are saying what is chris talking about because and correct me if i'm wrong but if you've got a sovereign wealth fund that has a f- hundred billion dollars and let's say the gold market is, and I know it's it's not this small, but let's just say the gold market was only ten billion dollars, and they've got to allocate, let's say, fifty billion. What do they do? They they can't buy fifty billion dollars worth of gold. And even if they could, because they're so huge and there's such a massive amount of capital, and the market is relatively small, even if they were able to buy uh, a certain amount, it would move the market tremendously to where. They they buy it at a super high themselves. price. Is, is that they'd, they'd hurt themselves? Correct. Yeah, they'd okay. hurt themselves, and and there would be a massive dislocation in the market because remember, if you look, it's all about liquidity. So um, if if you've got ten billion and you're trying to move it into a small, relatively illiquid. Currency, we just think about currencies for the moment. Forget about the gold market or silver market or any sector or whatever. And you wanted to move it into, let's take a really illiquid currency, um, Malawian kwacha. Okay. <laughs> There's you, one. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you will not be able to move that because there's no liquidity in there. You would normally, if you were going to take a $10 billion position, you would have to structure that trade over weeks or months. And drip feed it, and you would still move the market. Mm-hmm. So it's like buying penny stocks. Okay, it's essentially what it comes down to. So you go, okay, well, I'm not going to do the quacha, and you kind of keep moving up the curve. Well, what about the um, South African rand? It's a bit more liquid. Yeah, okay, and and you you get to the point where when you've got too much capital, you just can't move into these things without hurting yourself. Right. And so. Um, so the only option is the dollar, yen, or euro, period. Correct. When now, that and that's money, been the right? case for some time. The, the, the Paradoxically, that has allowed for the central banks and the governments of those countries to do things that they would never have otherwise been able to do if there was an exit valve, because right. they're all in the same sort of boat. Um, and... That can go on for as long as it can go as it can go on for. I don't know. I don't have any monopoly on the future or the truth. But yeah. what we do know is that going into this crisis, that was at extreme levels. Our debt to GDP levels were at extreme levels, um, and and now we're going into a position where those debts are going to explode. I mean, the the the, the Fed. What are they doing? Six trillion over the next nine months. Um, Fed's balance sheet's about four and a half. So they're doing like 150 uh, percent. Yes, it's now on Chris. Top Chris, you're like two days behind. <laughs> the Fed's balance sheet now it's at like 
That that, that four point five. Yeah, that was like three or four days ago. Yeah, get with the program, Chris. My goodness gracious. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it just gets ridiculous, it's, doesn't it? It just so, uh. so, so you have this. It's like the gas. Let's go back to the gas station. Okay, so we're going to buy the gas station, and we sit down and we're like, oh, okay. So they got some debts. Income is, uh, let, let's say, let's say they got half a million dollar dollars of debt, um, quarter million dollars a year of income, um, and we'll just forget about opex. Let's say that opex is fairly meaningless. Okay. Well, that's that's reasonable enough, depending on what the interest rate on the debt is and how it's termed, right? Now we come back two weeks later or a month later, and the debt's no longer half a million dollars; it's a million. But your income, and your income's not two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year; it's now half that, seven hundred seventy-five. That's essentially where we're at. So the debts are exploding, and GDP is collapsing. And we know that tax receipts are completely tied to GDP, irrespective of, of the tax rate. We've seen that. It's been proved. You can tax people higher or lower or whatever. doesn't have a material impact on, on actual tax receipts. So tax receipts are collapsing. That's back to our analogy of the gas station of 250 grand has gone now to, say, 175. And the debt's just exploded. So yeah. would you buy that company? We're like, yeah, nah. No, 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 no. This doesn't look so good. So then the question is, would you buy government debt? Would you buy, and again, government debt is just long-dated currency. So there's a, there's a period, I believe, a window where people are in this crazy, what I call the liquidity phase. Um, but when they come out of that and they start looking around and they're going, well, if I wouldn't own that gas station, and there's a share on the gas station, which is like a printed dollar. I don't think I want to take that dollar because I'm not sure it's going to be worth tomorrow or the next day. And then when they start seeing that inflation pick up in, the, in their everyday life, their behavior changes. So back to your question of the yield curve, they can keep the yield curve flat. But, and, and you can keep elevated certain asset prices on a nominal basis, but on a real basis, they're, they're falling in value. So that's the key is they, yes, it is possible to peg the yield curve, but it's going to come at a price and the price would most likely be the value of the dollar compared to what you, the average Joe or Jane buy on a daily basis. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. I mean, we get this, this crazy stuff that you can think about and I don't know how this transpires, but given the fact that we have these three major blocks of, um, of of um, currency or, and bond markets in the world and the fact that they have gotten more and more elevated is it possible that they just blow up literally pop and and what does that look like it's always a possibility in fact in isolation it would be a massive probability right now i just want to unpack that for everyone so if, if there wasn't uh, a Japan option, a euro, a euro mm -hmm. option, or a, a USD option, excuse me, a yen, euro, USD option. If it was just a yen option or just one, then it would be more probable that the, that the top would blow and we'd have this volcano, meaning you'd, basically you'd, you'd hyperinflation. Have, you'd, well, you'd have an exit valve. Okay, so let's pretend that Europe was fiscally sound, that was, you know, it wasn't doing any of these these crazy things. Japan was doing them, going bonkers. The US goes and does them, goes bonkers. Well, guess where the capital is going to move to? It's going to move to Europe. That's the exit valve. And it's it's liquid enough, it's deep enough to take it. And so those other two um, countries would have that experience of an of an inflationary blow up and the bond markets would, would collapse or get severely repriced. <clears throat> and they'd go back and do what it, pretty much every country in history has had to do. Um, devalue their currency um, and thus when you're just devaluing the currency again you're keeping the debts at a nominal value so yes you get paid back but in worthless dollars or yen or whatever it is but that's that's presupposing that the euro was had, had, had 
could take those capital flows and it was a place where you would want to put your money. The problem right. is that today none of those exist. They've all done it at once. And so there's this, this, this cluster of huge liquidity and it's the only place to go. And because there's no other real alternative, um, it's kind of get, gotten bigger and bigger. And now we're at a point where it's, it's just going bonkers. It's just, you, you, you know, a trillion is the new billion. Um, nothing's off the cards anymore. You literally throw the rule book out on all this stuff. And so the question is, where does that go? Um, and in that environment, you can have this, this, if we had a blow up of that nature, then we'd have a move into hard assets um, because people will just scramble for something that has some tangible value. Um, but, and I'm not sure what so that looks what, like. It seems so to me more likely that they will just simply do some sort of debt moratorium because it's debt that's the problem. And they'll just have to almost collectively do a, a massive rewrite. Like a jubilee, um, debt jubilee. Like a debt jubilee. And we've never, you know, the, the debt jubilees that I've tried to study and there's not a ton of information about them, they're also done um, in under a very different monetary regime. So you're kind of not comparing apples with apples. You know what I mean? Um, so it's hard to know what that would look like. But what does seem fairly obvious is if you've got something that in, is in infinite supply, um, it's less, should be less worth, worth less than something that's not in infinite supply. And if you just go back to, I mean, we're experiencing this right now. You're in lockdown, we're in a lockdown, much of the world is in some form of lockdown. And when you see what people start concentrating on, they're going and they're hoarding food and they're hoarding cash. You know, there's there's a there's a there's a safety mechanism where you stop and you start thinking about what really matters. You know, that I that that barista made latte that people thought was really important suddenly it's coming out the window it's not that important they're out getting toilet paper <laughs> so so if you just think about it as a psychological move people focus on what matters they focus on what actually um, is critical to their well-being and and their um, safety and security um, and then you can extrapolate that out to many other things and there's there's other I think there's plenty of opportunity that comes out of this. It'll be super chaotic, and I don't pretend to know exactly how it functions. But back to your question of what's S and P going to do? Largely, I don't care. I really don't care. There will be moves up and down. I'm not buying the S and P. I might be buying some companies that are within the S and P, but that's a different kind of trade. What I'm doing is I'm going back to the gas station. I'm going, what is going to survive? What does it look like? What does it look like further out? And if it's really cheap, and some of the stuff is just painfully cheap, then I'll buy it. And and then the way to deal with the inevitable um, gut wrenching volatility is to ensure that your position sizing is such that you just don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So if if you took like if you went in and you put fifty percent of your portfolio into something you thought it was like a bloody good deal um look i'll give you a good good example we talked about coal the other day yeah and i think coal is basically very similar to the tobacco stocks in the 90s so in in fact it's better but in the 90s everybody was every, every tobacco company was being sued because um we found out that tobacco lo and behold kills you so um and what people, what the market failed to understand was that you have a global market. And so the very centric in terms of the um, the Western world, which is where most of the media um, is concentrated on. And these things got absolutely obliterated and they paid a few fines and everything else. No one was really paying attention to the fact that um, outside of the Western world, People still smoked and they were increasing their consumption of cigarettes, particularly in Asia. Um, 
And because they had been repriced such that they were priced for bankruptcy, um, they were paying massive dividends. And if you had in the 90s just gone, look, these things are not going away. Cancer sticks are going to stay. People are going to, you know, and in Asia, if you paid attention, they're going to still smoke. Yeah. Um, you would have, you would have just bought the snot out of them. And over the next, that that is has been the best sector to date. Really, since the nineties. Since the nineties, there's been no better sector, and no one, and still nobody even knows it. And part of the reason was that you compounded all those dividend payments as well. Right. So, so. And look, that was that was just understanding the globe and looking at at consumption trends and then the pricing on those assets. If we take something like coal today, um, it's in a similar sort of situation. Much of the Western world has decided that coal is the enemy and and we can't use coal and so on and so forth. But if you just dig down and you look at firstly, there's med coal and then there's um, thermal coal, the very useful different things. So metallurgical coal. Well, coking coal is used to make steel. And so if we just forget about thermal coal, which is burnt for electricity usage, which is still 40% of global electricity usage, but we put that aside, we say, okay, are we going to get rid of coal? Well, if you get rid of coal, you get rid of steel. So good luck with that. Right. And yeah. are we going to stop building with steel? You know, And then you look at things like cement. It's, it's a major component in the manufacturing of cement. So like... When you actually dig into what it's being used for, it's like you realize it's it's if it goes away, it just means that the price of those other things readjusts and that the portions in the world that are producing um, and, and using coal are going to be in more in demand. It's, just, it's either that or we stop making shit with steel. And I don't think we're going there. Um, anyway, the point is you kind of look through – you get the, the biggest dislocations where you have a big market or a big zeitgeist that moves one way. So like tobacco companies. Oh, you can't own tobacco companies. Are you mad? These things are going away. I remember all the articles. You know, they're going to, we never, then they're, they're going away. We're not going to have them. And that was the best place to have your money in. You yeah. just sat on that for like 20 years and you would have made out like a, like a gangster. And, <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> you know, um, it, this is yeah, a great segue, though, Chris, because we I, I know a lot of the viewers who are watching this right now are just really super excited to hear some more of your investment ideas uh, that that last video was just I got a tremendous amount of positive feedback on that. Probably the most positive feedback Ooh. I've ever had on a video. And that includes Peter Schiff and all those people that are that are really big names. So and I can see why. Uh, it, even when we were talking, what you're saying is just kind of like really the light bulb came on. So let, let's first dive into coal because we talked about that uh, the other day. And I've gotten some very good comments pushing back and saying, well, I think Chris is a smart guy. I think it's interesting, but it's got this problem. It's got this problem yeah. it's got this problem and it's not necessarily that coal's going away but specifically we were talking about the uh the etf coal which is k-o-l so and i was saying that hey listen it's got this great dividend it's uh but one of the uh, and i'll just kind of give you some of the rebuttals and you can kind of go over if you think that's correct or how you see that and i think it's so important that whether we're looking at macro or we're looking at other investments that in order to be truly educated and know that what you're doing is right for your own portfolio, I think you've got to be able to argue both sides extremely 100%. well. I think if you can just argue one side and don't and just totally ignore the other side, I don't I think you're doing yourself a disservice. So let's kind of play that game back and forth. First of all, with coal KOL, they only pay a dividend once a year so you've got to hold this stock for the entire year and just hope that they make that dividend payment and if they don't then shoot you, you've held this stock that's probably going down in value or down in price and you don't get the benefit of why you own it in the first place so what would you say to that because it's a great uh, rebuttal 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's two things, of course, because you can buy it for a dividend. But if your equity price goes down 10, 20 percent, like it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, so um, so that's the first thing. And again, if you go back and for anyone that's interested, you can have a look and, and dig into the tobacco stocks and how um, dividends were, were changed a lot um, in that very volatile period. And equity prices were very volatile. So, like, if you went and you in in, in what well, was I think it was ninety seven. I'm trying to think when the when the um, the big there were a bunch of big cases that came out against like British American Tobacco got sued. Um, they had to stop advertising. They weren't allowed to advertise anywhere, and and a lot of them slashed dividends because like they were in that that phase where they were going, holy shit, we got to like we've got to make sure that we survive um and so they were slashing dividends equity prices were getting cut so you could have you could have had a situation for example where your dividend was just say for shits and giggles 10 percent and then they and then the equity price would get hammered which would if you'd bought it at the new equity price your dividend yield was now maybe 20 percent right but then they'd slash the dividend and 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 you you went through this sort of chaotic period where they essentially stabilized um, but the thing to think about is buying in that chaos there where you could, it comes back to what I said at the start, like you buy what's cheap. You're never going to know whether it will get, it might get cheaper. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you, gas station, right? Would you buy it at a certain value? You go, yep, that's cheap. Um, tomorrow could, you know, the, the owner could have said, Hey, I'll, I'll take 20% less and you get a 20% cut. But you're never going to know if that's the case or not. So you just you've got to buy what's what's cheap. And if you, you know, the ability that you've got with the stock, <clears throat> with fairly liquid stocks, is that you can you can dip your toe in, and you can put in maybe half a point position or something like that, and then even put in stink bids. But the point is, you you you're never going to know exactly. But back to your question there, with <clears throat> with the tobacco stocks, over the course of like the next twenty years, if you'd put in. Um, what was the numbers we were looking at before? It was 97. If you had put in, I think it was 10th, an investment of, that's right, it was an investment of about 15,000 bucks between 97 and 2016. Just your dividend payments um, amounted to $50,000. So um, you put in 15, you got 50, and then the equity prices all repriced over time because you were buying it at that point where everyone had said these things are going away. They're not. They're, they're finished. In that, in the first, but if, and you can pull up the charts on all the various companies. You actually went through a period of shit all best about seven, eight years where it was like this. It was very volatile. It was. It was, you know, it was a situation where you. You'd second guess yourself, George. You'd be like, "Oh, it's going, it's going up. I think I'm right." And then you'd be like, "Oh, fuck! It went down again." And and you had this this kind of very volatile period. And you tend to get that at the bottoming of markets, where it's 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 forming a base, right? right. Um, but over time, then it's it's you know all your sellers moved away, um, and um, and you kind of. The base was formed, and off you went again. And yeah. you, so, back to your question on coal, um, it's a it's a very whoever um, mentioned that is dead on. You can have um, dividends can be cut in these companies. Um, the equity price absolutely can get hit. What I'd suggest you do is just go and have a look at even individual companies. I mean, coal is just an easy ETF, but you can go and there's plenty really good companies out there, and then you just look at their debts. See if they've got debt as it turned out. What's it look like? What are their cash flows like? Um, and and um, and then you back to that gas station situation, and it's much easier to to look at that. Um, I mean, I could throw one out there. Stan also, is, is an also, Aussie listed one. It's got yeah, no debt. Zero, literally zero debt. <laughs> like literally zero. Yeah, I, I looked that yeah, up. No, there's it, zero. It's it's got a like return on equity is about eighty percent. Um, trades at a PE of about last I looked at about two point eight. It's probably cheaper today. I mean, that's the thing. 
I don't care. Like trading at a PE of 2.8. That was when I last looked at it probably a month ago. And 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 I'll buy these and then I just like I'm not going to sit there and worry every day and go, oh, what's it at today? I don't yeah. care. But because it's not 50 percent of your portfolio, that that's that's key, I think. Correct. Yeah, correct. Few Going people have the stomach to to be able to to manage that if it was a fifty percent position. Um, however, I would be far more comfortable owning a company that I know has no debt, that I know is not going away, than owning something like Tesla. I mean, people have like shit like that in their portfolios where it's like a 10, 20, 30, 50 percent position. And it's <laughs> like, uh, anyway. Yeah. So, OK, going back to um, just kind of the coal sector and then I want to move on because I want to give people some they, they've heard the the video and what you're uh, thinking about. But I want to get some new uh, tips from you, some new ideas. So uh, but just quickly on the coal thing. Now, if I'm correct, a lot of these coal companies went uh, went chapter 11 in 2000, maybe 16, 17. So if you look at the dividend, like like in KOL prior to 2017, you're like, well, this is nothing special. Now it's a, a let's say a dollar five. Back then it was only like five cents or like, uh, you know, 10 cents or something like that. But correct me if I'm wrong, but what they're doing is they're looking at two completely separate balance sheets right there. Yeah, you can't. They're not the same company. I mean, it's it's yeah, right. It's been restructured, and yeah. So you got to be careful. Don't go and I've seen people do this. They'll pull up a chart and they go, "Oh my God, it was hundred dollars a share, and now it's twenty cents or two dollars or whatever the case might be," thinking that it's going to go back to hundred dollars a share. It's not the way it is. It's a different company. So you got to right. just look at it and say, "Well, what is it today?" And um, and the same thing with the ability. Yeah. For to pay their dividend correct yeah. yeah yeah okay great so we we talked about that let's move on uh if you've got like three more ideas or even a couple more ideas that we didn't mention the other day and i, I know you've got tons of these ideas in your research letter and at the end of this video we'll go ahead and and mention the uh promotion that you guys were nice enough to do for my viewers, we mentioned that on the other video, but we'll, we'll save that for the end. But uh, a couple more ideas, a couple more things you're thinking about out there that would do well because of this crazy environment where you're saying there's a lot of opportunity. Um, look, we've got about a dozen things that we that we're interested in. Um, in the short term, you know, we talked about tankers before. That's that's a now. That's mm -hmm. a that's a right now. It's almost most of the time we're looking at long term investments. And and you know, shipping in general was was um, down anyway. It was it's very difficult to find anybody that's covering shipping and included in that basket are tankers. So tankers are just the ones that carry fuel. Um, and so they are um, they're like you know. Just don't even finish watching this. Just go out and start buying tankers because that's a no-brainer trade. <laughs> All right. So we, we've talked um, about that before. Let's just actually focus on one idea that we didn't mention the other day, which would be a cheap play right now considering the environment, but something that you want to hold for like 10 years, 15 years. That's just a really deep value play. Energy. Energy. In general. So... So within the energy, I mean, we could talk about uranium. Um, what I, I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds. Energy is, I believe, going to become very localized. Okay. So, and, and we've had this global market where where energy can move around the world, whether it be natural gas, um, coal, lignite, oil, whatever you like, and. I've been talking about this for ages and ages on the blog. We're moving more into a into a world whereby um, geopolitical political tensions are increasing, and very importantly, the U.S. military is stepping back from that global role of patrolling the oceans. That's going to have really significant impacts on supply chains, on the cost of moving goods, and what it's going to do is it's going to force people towards particular energy sources dependent on their location. 
Um, this virus that that's we're experiencing or the world we're in now is just accelerating that to an extent I'd never imagined possible. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, but but that is there's a there's a lot to unpack in that. But I would suggest to people to just to focus on energy, and you can look at particular countries, for example, and see which country would use a particular energy source and why. Um, and and so obviously coal fits into that narrative. But uranium is another one. Um, it's still it's massively underpriced. Um, there's every reason to believe that um, that on a um, on a global basis we're going to use much more than we have in the past we're already seeing the build out of nuclear facilities to that extent um, and the other thing behind that is there's a lot of actual misinformation around the uranium market and and for anyone that's listening I strongly suggest um, spending some time in listening to Mike Elkin, who's a good buddy of mine. Um, and um, in full disclosure, I'm invested in his his fund as well, as well as we own a number of positions within. So how would someone f watch those videos, Chris? Is that he's, YouTube? Or? Yeah, he's got stuff on YouTube. Um, I've done some some podcasts and stuff with him. You can search our, our blog and there's stuff on there. I think uranium is perfect because I know I've, I've got a lot of viewers that are really interested. So what I'd would be, be to own that for the next 10 years? You know, if, if you, you're talking about that, that trade, um, okay. what uranium. would you own? Uranium, definitely. Or well, maybe not 10 years um, because uranium tends to reprice really quickly um, oh. and then get go from like severely overvalued to <laughs> severely undervalued. And part of that is also because of the the, the consumers of uranium are price insensitive. Um, the utilities just don't give a shit really about the price. They need supply. Supply is most important because the cost component within within a nuclear facility of uranium is is tiny. It's inconsequential to their overall operations. Right. So they don't really care what price they pay. What they do have to have is supply because they can't run the whole thing without it. And so it creates a very, um, a very extremely um, exciting market if you if you if you're wanting like real asymmetric moves in any yeah. particular um, commodity. But so uranium's really really great one. Um, but you don't need so to listen to me. You could talk. And then what would the uh, what would the bear argument be? The the intelligent bear argument for uranium, and why would that be wrong? The intelligent bear argument um, revolves around what the industry pricing um, mechanism has been, um, and I don't really want to point fingers, but there's a there's a there's an industry um, consultants, I guess they're called, um, that that the market uses to understand what the forward rate of uranium pricing is, um, and I'm not sure if there are incompetent or if they are uh, or what but um they're wrong and i know that's a big thing to say um you know but the the issue is that no one's focused on that market for so long and that kind of fell into a, into the space of actually becoming the um the price um, providers in that space, and and um, and none of this should make sense. It's it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and so there's a severe mispricing in that market, um, and I don't really know exactly how long it takes for that for the market to to figure that out. Um, but as long as it doesn't figure it out, that's our window of opportunity, in my opinion. So that's uranium. I mean, I don't. There isn't a there isn't a rational. I haven't seen a rational um, uh, bear argument against uranium. From what I've heard, uh, there could be a, an alternate uh, source that that's and, uh, and the the name is escaping me. I apologize, but it was it was wasn't uranium. It's like this new type of energy source that is competing with uranium that they didn't they haven't used. 
at all, but it could come onto the market and completely make uranium obsolete. You probably know what I'm talking about. Is there yeah. any validity yeah. to that? You know, it's funny. Um, I used to run a venture capital firm, and I can't tell you how many people would send me through um, revolutionary new technologies that, that had the potential to do any number of different things across all sectors. And um, in my younger days, I would have gotten excited about it. Um, my answer now is show me industry using it. Now, that doesn't mean that some of these technologies might not have the potential to do that. They might. But until I actually see take up by uh, market participants, it's irrelevant. It is irrelevant to me because even if it is the best thing since light spread, unless someone's going to use it, then it doesn't really matter. Um, and of course, people will turn around and go, well, that's your huge opportunity. No one's figured it out. You should, you know. Um, but I, I could, if I had put a dollar into every single um, idea like that, that seemed plausible, um, I would have spent a million dollars. And you know how much I'd have for, to show for it today? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> That's the reality. So investing is a matter of probability. And even if there's some technology out there that's wonderful and amazing, unless the 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 market actually takes it up, it's not gonna it's not worth my time. The other thing is that I don't have the ability to understand I'm not a scientist or a or a biochemist or whatever it is, depending on the sector. So I don't have the, the technical competency to really evaluate um those whatever it is whether it's an energy source or whatever that's the first thing the people that have the competency to do that are the ones that are staffed in the companies that would benefit from it and so when i see those companies taking measures towards that particular um, sector then i get interested that's one of the reasons we talked about hydrogen so hydrogen is something that we have uh, spent some time on um, again do I think hydrogen is the best thing? Is is like I don't know. I, I can I'm, I can read like everybody else, and I can go through the data and and I can have a bear or a, or a bull argument about it. Where I get interested is when I see an uptake. So like we got interested in hydrogen when China basically flipped their whole subsidy programs and said screw it on EVs, we're going down the hydrogen route. Of course, Japan's been down the hydrogen route for a long time. They want a whole hydrogen economy. Um, and so those kinds of, of look, and look, maybe both those governments are completely stupid and it's uneconomical. It doesn't really matter if they're going to go after it and they're going to spend billions and billions of dollars developing hydrogen powered um, cars, trains, buses, they're going to do it. It means that the the, the companies that are producing that and all, they're going to do well, you know, whether whether I think it's a good idea or not. And so, you know, back to the whole uranium side of things, um, same thing. I mean, there's I can't tell you how many people keep coming out with different solutions and so on and so forth. Until I start seeing um, industry take that seriously, then I don't have the time for it really. Um, so outside of the, the bare arguments for uranium that I've seen all center around data, I believe, to be inaccurate. All right, okay. All right. So what do you think the, with uranium, what do you think your downside is? What do you think your upside is? And uh, I guess the timing, if the asymmetry is extreme enough, that I guess the timing really doesn't matter. But do, do you have any idea on the timing? So far... You know, when, when we got into, we started looking at uranium 2016, didn't really do anything. Um, and then late 2017, um, and by the way, I, you know, one of the, um, I messed up on uranium. I took some small positions, uh, what was it, maybe like 2013, 14, somewhere there. Um, and what I what I didn't understand, and many participants didn't understand, was the whole underfeeding. So underfeeding created a massive supply of uranium in the market, which I never understood. So I completely got that wrong. 
Fortunately, when I position size stuff, as mentioned before, it was such that it didn't wipe me out. Um, and and I and I sold out of those positions at a loss. Um, that whole underfeeding has now been soaked up by the markets, and we, I, I would guess we're probably no more than a year or two out from um, real real supply crunch on on that side of things. Um, and most of the bulls that actually got in to uranium um, got burnt, and they've been hesitant to come back because they got burnt. And right. remember, they came into it when when it was already pretty cheap. So you had this kind of bear, long bear markets. Pretty much everybody got washed out. You had a, you know, a few participants who started getting back in because they thought that was the bottom, myself included, and then they got washed out. And so it's a it's a very unique market in that there's very few people who are pretty who are willing to put their hand up and say, I think this might be yeah, it. There's no more buyers left, or at least there's no more sellers left, that's for sure. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, 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 exactly. So um so no, I mean it's it's what's the downside? Look, prices can can go anywhere, especially in this kind of market. In a liquidity driven in market, um you sell what you have to sell. It's just that simple, um, and and so um, if if you're if you're a fund manager and you get a redemption and you've got some uranium in your portfolio, you flog it. The good thing with <clears throat> with um, well, I said a good thing. One of the things that people could look at is there's the uranium ETF, which is URA, which um, by the way is garbage. I wouldn't wouldn't buy in it, but when people try and get exposure to um, to a sector, they'll often say, well, you know, is there an easy way to do that? And sometimes there's an ETF that will give you easy exposure. The problem with that particular one was they restructured it a year and a half ago, and they put a whole lot of equities into it, which aren't really uranium. They're kind of loosely correlated in some shape or form because they just needed more liquidity because no one's even playing in that sandpit anymore. Oh, right. Um, so the, the downside to that is that if you're buying that, you're not really actually getting exposure like you think you are. Um, and there's two sides to this. So if you go and you bought equities that are not in an ETF, when you have redemptions from large asset managers, they typically, you won't get a down downward pressure in those equities yeah. that you're into. Yeah? Because they're not in that ETF. The... The corollary of that is in a bull market, when people pile in, that's the first thing they'll pile into. They'll be like, oh, I'll just buy an ETF. And so yeah. you can have stuff going up in an ETF, which which doesn't, like they think they're buying uranium and they're buying the ETF. And so you like have equities that are, that are going up, even though they're not actually um, uh, directly related to that ETF. So it's just something to think about. Um, and... But for, to protect your downside, um, it's quite. It can be quite useful to look at stuff that's not listed in an ETF, because in a liquidity like phase like we're in now, um, when you get margin calls, that all takes place often in indexes, ETFs, passive type um, algos. Those companies don't. Those those um, trading houses and portfolio managers won't often go out and buy. You know some company listed on the ASX that's not in an ETF or some company in Canada or whatever the case might be. So you can limit your downside, you know, as a consequence. But remember that in a bull market, um, sometimes you might want to look at it because you have the stuff that's sitting in the ETF will just get fund flows um, because right. it's in an ETF. Of course, if there's something that moves into an ETF, then you can have a real re-rating. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, that's what we've seen with Tesla, right, George? So Tesla has benefited massively from so many different. It's been in, it's in, been included in so many different um, ETFs and index funds and so on and so forth. You know, pretty much anyone. Like there's, there's I was talking to a mate of mine the other day, and um, he's got a friend of his who used to work with um, with Soros who's now going out and raising some money for an e ECG or whatever fund and um, and and I, I you know those guys will go and they'll buy something like Tesla just because you can't have 
you know, in theory, you can't have something that's um, all about EVs and saving the world and all that, and then not own Tesla. So they just buy it, and they don't care about whether it's what the price is. It's like a um, PR thing. It's not really like an investment. Yeah, yeah, and that's just that's dangerous territory. I mean, that's like if you're into momentum trading and all that, fine, knock yourself out. It's just it's not it's not a game I want to play. Yeah. So when you talk about these opportunities that may or may not be inside the ETF, and maybe some of them are on the Aussie exchange or the Singapore outside the U.S., for your readers, your your retail people that get your research letter, are they able to participate? In, in those, do they just have to have an uh, interactive broker account, even if they're Americans, or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, we always tell people that the best, the best that I've come across is interactive brokers for um, bread, for the broadest market exposure. You can buy pretty much anything around the world. <clears throat> um, it's And it's got the best fee structure. Um, also importantly, IB don't run a prop desk. So, and what I mean by that is, if you look at a lot of the brokers that have that have screwed people over in the over the years, it's where they've got a large asset management company, they've got a brokerage, you know, um, division over here, and then they got their proprietary trading over here. And when these guys mess up, they dip in. That's what that's what MF Global did, right? Was they dipped into the funds from um, across that Chinese wall, um, and so when I pick brokerage outlets and things of that nature, I'll always look and see, do these guys have a prop desk? And I know in theory and in law, they can't commingle funds and all, but we've seen enough of that to, you know, in the past where theory and law just get washed away in the in the time of a crisis and your business is potentially going to go bust and you've got the ability to go and tap client capital. Guess what people do? Um, and so, um, you know, I guess my point is they don't have a, a prop desk. I don't have any proprietary trading. So, so you don't run that sort of risk. Yeah, so your counterparty but, risk is not as high with an interactive broker. But it, it sounds like uh, with most of the ideas that you have with your research, whether I'm in Australia, Canada, the UK, United States, wherever I am in the world, as long as I have an uh, interactive broker account, then I can most likely participate with, with most of the ideas that you 100%. suggest in your research. Okay. I mean, most of the time, even with like a Schwab account, um, you know, the way that we'll do, um, we'll structure stuff for the research service is we'll, we'll have the particular sector or theme that we're into, and then we'll give multiple ways of executing on that theme. Okay. Um, and that's going to, because it's going to differ. Some of our clients are, are fund managers who will, get into you know structured options trades or whatever the case might be and other people are just like whoa that's just too much for me i just want something pretty simple um it might be an etf it might just be um three or four what what you know we kind of almost structure our own little etfs if you will and there'll be a number of different equities um and in those instances 90 percent of the time you can do that through just a fairly traditional account um and, and your research letter walks you through how to do that and, and and whether you're someone who wants to get into an ETF or maybe buy individual stocks or to your point, build your own little ETF that, that's available in your... Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll give, like I said, a sector that we're interested in and then we'll give the ways that you can execute on that and, okay. and the pros and cons to that. And then you can, you know, choose from that, that bucket, if you will, as to which of those suit you because it's really going to depend on your own skill set and so on and so forth. But most of the stuff you can do with a fairly traditional Schwab or TD America trade account. But certainly if you don't, if you're you know, looking to set up an, an account, then I have not found a better broker thus far than IB. And I don't get paid to say that. I just, I used to use Saxo, um, who used to be really good and they just got shittier and shittier over the years. Um, and so I don't, I still have accounts with them, but by and large, 99% of what we do is just through IB. Yeah, I, I want to, I sure appreciate it. It's been fascinating. And I know people are going to love this kind of part two, just as much, if not more than they enjoyed part one. So for the promotion that uh, you guys were nice enough to 
give my viewers. We'll go ahead and put that up on the screen so you guys can look at that. We'll put a, a link, an affiliate link. It's a great way to get a, a fantastic deal on some amazing, amazing research. As you can tell, Chris really knows his stuff and it's a great way to support the channel. But for those of you who want to just find out more about your backstory, should they just go to Twitter? And I think you're, you're capitalist uh, EXP on EXP. Twitter. Is that the best place? Yeah, yeah. Or the website, Capitalist Exploits. Um, okay. Understand. All right, buddy. Well, I appreciate your time again, and I can't wait to do it again. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Always, always fun to chat to you, George.